This is Michael Smook for YouTube Talks. Today is May 13th. It's a Saturday and we're in the year 2017. This is the 15th episode of our ongoing conversations. I'm speaking to you from my home in Forest Hills, New York. That's in Queens County, which is an outer borough of the city of New York, of course. The topic of today's conversation is entitled Trillion Dollar Question. The question we're going to be discussing is, is the United States safe post 9-11? Chapter 1, we're going to be talking about the past. To understand the past, it'll help us uh, connect the dots and get us to a point where uh, we are today. Let's talk about the Cold War from the mid-40s to the late 80s, early 90s. In those days, the United States chief rival and existential threat was the Soviet Union and the worldwide communist insurgency. Chapter 2, we will talk about uh, what happened on 9-11 and what the United States has done since then. In Chapter 3, we'll talk about what's keeping me up at night. What unexpected adverse circumstances could happen with the United States perhaps is less prepared to manage and uh, it could cause death, significant economic loss, and severe psychological trauma. Uh, in addition, what I'll be talking to you about is what we could do to minimize or mitigate uh, the worst things from happening so we can all get to a good place. And then I'll summarize. And that's the uh, introduction, giving you an outline of what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to answer the trillion dollar question. Um, first, uh, well the trillion dollar question, we're primarily what we're going to be focusing on are issues related to homeland, uh, safety, national security, and it's going to cover intelligence, police, military actions, support agencies like the Transportation Safety Administration, and uh, other efforts that are done, including civilian, uh, civilian defense, civil defense. Um, but uh, before we talk about that, in the pre-introduction, I want to briefly cover with you other issues that are of supreme importance in national security. And what I'm talking about is obeying the rule of law, uh, uh, a peaceful transition in governments in the executive and legislative branch, and uh, the strong economic position of the United States. When things are going well economically in the United States, frequently all good things flow from that. Uh, now in the pre-introduction. Um, the United States, what really holds us together is uh, 200 plus years of our Constitution in place uh, with uh, the Federalist structure of government which gives balance of authority between the federal government the states and local government, as well as the Bill of Rights, the, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, and subsequent amendments. Those are the supreme laws of the land which hold us together. Secondly, what uh, is very important in terms of national security, security as far as this pre-introduction, is that uh, the peaceful transition uh, in the presidential elections, it is contentious, there is argument, and there is some disharmony, but there is peace. No civil wars, uh, no, uh, no, no insurrections. It's a rather peaceful transition. It's not going to be an easy transition, but it's a peaceful transition. And that's with the executive branch and the legislature branch and the courts, and that's between Democrats, Republicans, and everybody else. The third thing I want to talk about that's of vital importance to national security stems from the fact, well, the United States is the world's great economic power. Our economy, uh, no, the number two economy in the world, China, which is a very powerful economy, their economy is 60% the size of the United States, but it's, and they have four times as many people. Uh, the United States, there are half a dozen economic indicators that indicate the United States is going well. But the one thing that I think played a significant role in the Republican uh, defeating the Democrat in the recent elections stems from the fact economic growth is at 2% or less per year. 
And that's why in previous videos I've talked about how, number one, we need to uh, appreciate the American economy, which is the envy of the world in so many different industries, with a breadbasket to the world, uh, and uh, we're the most productive agricultural uh, network in the world, the United States. And uh, what I've said in previous YouTube talks is that what we need to do, in addition to recognizing our economic prowess, we need to strengthen the middle class and expand it through multilateral free trade agreements to uh, allow us to create opportunities to create new markets to sell our goods as well as to buy goods at a cost-effective price which will be better for our economy as well. So the United States could benefit, <clears throat> our long-term allies could benefit, our new trading partners, let's say Vietnam and in multilateral trade agreements, for example, the Pacific Trade Partnership. If the United States, uh, within this 12-nation tentative agreement, if we walk back and embrace this agreement, our, our economic rivals, the Chinese, and our also partners, the Chinese, we could better negotiate with them more favorable trade relations if the United States and other nations, which represent 40% of the world's gross domestic product, were to engage the Chinese in conversation, we will negotiate from strength. Now, also, I understand because economic growth hasn't been as robust as it should be, um, that uh, the middle class doesn't feel middle class, and low income, even though this is a time of relative prosperity, uh, they have no hope of ele elevating themselves from low income to low middle class and middle class. So we need to strengthen the uh, middle class and expand it to reach low income folks. And I think one thing we could do, sure we want to keep as many businesses in the United States, but sometimes a company like Carrier Air Conditioner is going to go to Mexico to assemble air conditioners. And to I'm listening closely to uh, residents of the state of Indiana and West Virginia and other states where unemployment is higher and people are struggling. I hear you. And what I'm saying is what the United States needs to do is we need to rebuild the country on an infrastructure rebuilding process. And I think we need to start small with pilot projects. The American people need to see that uh, when mistakes are made, corrective measures are made, uh, uh, government highlights what went right and we established best practices and uh, from then on uh, people will see that the federal government initiatives uh, this may be totally run by the federal government it may be outsourced to the private sector it may be a little a mix of both but they'll see that an, a federal initiative works right now the American people uh, they believe the federal government is good at uh, cutting social security checks and, and the American people have a lot of have a lot of confidence in our military but what they've forgotten is that 70 and 80 years ago under Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal we built the Hoover Dam we built hospitals bridges and we did tremendous projects people have forgotten that the American government and the federal government took the lead and uh, we, in, a different, in a number of different ways, we help rebuild, the, uh, rebuild America. And we have trillions of dollars of infrastructure, roads, bridges, lead lace pipes that are poisoning our children in Flint, Michigan, we could work on. And there are other areas of infrastructure, but time prevents us from going into detail about that. We're just in the pre-introduction. But what I'm saying is, that, there, that um, I have some ideas that differ from the, pre the present presidential administration, but I think it's multilateral trade agreements and uh, infrastructure rebuilding process, go small, pilot projects, and then we'll work our way to robust actions. Well, now that I've uh, summarized national security uh, the, and understanding the rule of law, peaceful transition in governments, and I'm also talking about my prescription a plan for the United States to re-energize the economy, build on what the 44th president of the United States, the Democrat, did uh, in pulling the United States from a near depression condition. And the one area we need to re-energize the economy, increase the rate of growth without spurring on inflation. These are my ideas what we need to do. 
Now let's get back to the main topic of this conversation. We've done the introduction, we took a step back, and we did the pre-introduction. Now let's go to the first chapter. Now let's talk about 9-11 and uh, what happened that day, and then we'll go on to what I think are, are uh, things that worry me about. What's the next thing that could come up that could create adverse uh, situations and how we can handle it. Now let's talk about, um, for chapter one, immediately after World War II. Let's talk about the Cold War and how we experienced the Cold War and uh, what we learned from that situation. Uh, the Cold War really started at the end of World War II. And uh, what happened is the United States with the British, the French, Canadians, and Russia, Soviet Union, what were our allies? We defeated the Nazis and the Italians in Europe. That war ended first before the war in, in Asia. And what the United States did was at the same time we're pulling our men and women home from Europe, back home, the, the Soviets occupied Eastern Europe. And they didn't leave for the next 40 years, 45 years. Uh, what happened is the, the, the Soviet Union occupied hung, Hungary, uh, Hungary, uh, they occupied Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, and other countries. And um, the Russians motivated, and I'm not making excuses for them, I'm a patriotic American, but the Russians' motivation was uh, they lost 20 million people in the war. 10 million soldiers and 10 million civilians. So the Russians' perspective was they felt they needed a buffer zone from the United States, France, Britain, and uh, the West Germans. And so what the Soviets did is they came and didn't leave for the next 40, 45 years. They created uh, totalitarian regimes. We call them satellite governments that were uh, responsive to the men in the Kremlin, in, uh, in Moscow that ruled the Soviet Union. And uh, they created totalitarian states in the countries that I just mentioned. Uh, and uh, in those countries, they created secret police, army, and they kept their own secret police, the Soviets, and army in there to maintain order. And, and uh, at the same time, this all happened by 1947. Winston Churchill came to the United States in 1947, and he said in a speech uh, to the American people, he said that there was a dividing line between East Europe which was, uh, which was captive to a totalitarian Russians and the free West, Western Europe. The, the line between the two Europes was he called the Iron Curtain. And from that time on, in, in the parlance of the day, uh, the Europe was known as uh, those under Soviet rule were known as being within the Iron Curtain. And that's through 1947. Then what happened is, at the same time after the war ended in 1945, there was a civil war between the communist Chinese, uh, led by Mao Zedong and his number one deputy, Cho An Lai. And on the other side were the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, known as the Nationalist Party, or the Kuomintang. And what happened is, there was a civil war. It was over by 1947. Mao, Cho An Lai, and the communists were victorious. Uh, Mao and Chou Enlai started to rule the mainland China from Beijing, China. The nationalists uh, fleed to 90 miles off of the coast of China to, uh, it was known as Formosa, and now, now it's re re frequently referred to as Taiwan. And uh, the, the, the nationalists, or Kuomintang, uh, always wanted to come back to China and, uh, and fight the war again and take over, but that hasn't happened and it will probably never happened. So, so what happened is within four years after the war, the American people thought, well, we had a hot war. We defeated uh, Hitler for Germany. We defeated Tojo for the Japanese. And uh, we had this terrible hot war for four years. And we gave everything we had. And now we were embraced in a cold war led by the Soviet Union and the communist Chinese. So we had to deal with a cold war. And uh, at the same time, uh, communism was viewed upon as, uh, as a political economic philosophy that uh, it was secular. It wasn't religious. It, was, uh, it didn't believe in God, but it believed in uh, Marxist philosophy, which guided uh, these two communist giants. And uh, so 
what happened is um, communism, the American people interpreted it to mean as that communism was a messianic faith and the communists were going to try to take over much of the world. And this was uh, reflected in, uh, we had wars in uh, Korea, the North Koreans invaded the South, the North Koreans are communists, the South Koreans are allied with us, the Chinese got involved, we got involved, and uh, there was a war there in the 50s, and then there was a war in the 60s and 70s in Vietnam, another North-South war. And what did the United States to do? What philosophy did we have? And let's go back to, there was a diplomat, his name was George Kennan. He was a State Department official, and he later became a, an ambassador to the Soviet Union, and he was also an ambassador to Yugoslavia. And Kennan's uh, philosophy was in a document called the Long Telegram. It was later called the Containment Theory. And what Kennan said the United States and the West needed to do, understanding the Soviet mindset of the men in Moscow who were leading the Soviet Union, uh, Kennan said we needed to embrace something called the Containment Theory. And the Containment Theory stated that we needed to use diplomacy we needed to use our economic might. We needed to uh, work at our, at our intelligence prowess. We needed to provide uh, military supplies to our, our allies. And at times, we needed to uh, commit our armed forces. From time to time, depending upon a situation, we need to use measured responses in meeting the Soviets, the Chinese, and what they were doing to try to overturn governments in in the West and in the developing world. So Kennan gave us a framework which was very helpful to the United States. Sometimes we were successful, sometimes not so, but at least it gave us a framework to work with. What's happening in the United States was uh, we see disharmony in, in the United States. Uh, in the middle of all this disharmony, what happened is, well, we're spying on the Soviets, they're spying on us, and perhaps in, at times it felt that they were more successful. There were two American citizens who were bribed by the Soviets. They had access to secrets to, for the atomic bomb, the Rosenbergs. They were uh, caught, tried, convicted, and executed in 1953. This had a chilling effect on the United States. Essentially, what uh, uh, many Americans felt was, well, if the Rosenbergs did this and sold secrets to the atomic bomb to the Russian Soviets, uh, how could, uh, what else is going on? What, what else is going on that undermines the United States? What kind of espionage, subterfuge is going on? They're not going to attack us straight on. They're going to do it in an underhanded way. And this was the great fear. And we refer to that sometimes as a red scare. Um, in a previous video, I talked about the Hollywood blacklist. And part of this all started when in Washington, D.C., you had a Republican Congress, and they, they felt and by 1947 that the Soviet Union surreptitiously was trying to take over the cultural capital of the United States by, uh, by uh, uh, seducing writers, producers, directors in Hollywood to believe in uh, communist philosophy and that the movies would really be fronts for communist philosophies. And uh, what they did is they uh, called writers, producers, directors, known as the Hollywood Ten, to Washington, D.C. And, and really, um, uh, some of these men uh, were uh, members of the Communist Party, but they were loyal Americans, and it was not a crime to be a member of the Communist Party. But with communist takeover of parts of the world, uh, we developed a, uh, a sense of hysteria in the United States. And, fear overcame us, and there was a plurality, or perhaps a majority of Americans. It's sometimes known as uh, the totalitarian of uh, the, uh, it, the totalitarian majority. And that's sort of what happened in the United States. People became fearful, and the Hollywood Ten were blacklisted from working in Hollywood, and uh, several hundred actors were also blacklisted from working in Hollywood in TV, radio, movies, and live performances. And uh, this is in from 1947 throughout the 50s. And it wasn't until uh, the 60s 
where the Hollywood blacklist wore off. What happened? In, it really happened from 1963 to 1974. This is what happened. In 1963, John Kennedy was assassinated. By 1968-69, Lyndon Johnson, uh, who could have been a great president, he did many things on the domestic front. He, uh, the United States was engaged in a war in South Vietnam, and Johnson uh, was unpopular, and he, he did not run for re-election. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the next president was Richard Nixon, and Nixon was involved in the Watergate scandal, and the cover-up was worse than the crime. The president knew all about the cover-up, and uh, he had to resign. So what I'm talking about is an 11-year time frame, and I'm talking about the fact that people were far less concerned about whether uh, the Soviet Union were trying to undermine the United States through the cultural capital of America, and we no longer ask federal government employees or empl employees working in the private sector to sign loyalty oaths. And if people had ever gone to any kind of meeting that might have been uh, to the pol uh, communist sympathizers or in the parlance of the day, politically to the left, uh, they could have lost their jobs. So the, Uni the United States, we changed our focus and we started thinking uh, a lot more about uh, our leadership at the, highest, at the highest point in American government. Uh, we lost faith for a while in our leaders. And uh, anyway, so what happened was what ended the Cold War was in the late 80s, early 90s is the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. It, economically, the communist system was not productive, and the Soviets uh, simply couldn't afford to maintain their empire. The countries to the south of the Soviet Union, the Stans, Kazakhstan, other, other countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, broke away from the Soviet Union, uh, as did the satellite countries like Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and some other countries on uh, close to the Eastern Bloc, um, and I'm thinking Ukraine and Moldova. So the Soviet Union collapsed. When it was the Soviet Union, there were 330, 340 million people. Uh, with all of these outer uh, republics and satellite uh, countries uh, leaving the Soviet orbit, uh, Russia, uh, in terms of landmass, it's still the largest country in the world. It's two and a half times the size of the United States. The population is just 140 million. Its economic is not as great. They're the 11th largest economy in the world, but we still pay attention to the, now they're called Russians, we pay attention to them because they have nuclear weapons and Western and Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, rely on them for uh, uh, gas and oil. And uh, so they still have a, a, a voice uh, on the stage, the world stage, but they're, and they are powerful, but they're not as power, powerful as they used to be. But what I'm just describing to you is about a 45-year time frame where the United States, uh, it felt like the communists were taking over the world, and in terms of espionage, they were stealing our nuclear secrets, and it was a time of great fear in the United States, and we had to work our way through that. The containment theory helped, and we also had to work through our own domestic problems with presidents disappointing us, and one president being murdered. Um, so. That about covers uh, chapter one in terms of uh, what's happened in the past. And just to summarize, what we're talking about is the United States were a nation state, the Soviet Union and the China, Communist Chinese are a nation state, and what we had to do is we had to engage them in many different ways through the containment theory, and then we had to get past our own problems. And that, uh, that helps us a lot by understanding what happened in our past from uh, from the mid-40s. After, after a hot war, we had a cold war for 45 years, and we were able to work ourselves through it in, in a way that ensured American peace and prosperity. Let's talk about 9-11, uh, September 11, 2001. I remember that day well. I worked three and a half blocks from the World Trade Center. Well, this is what happened. Uh, four planes were hijacked. Two planes crashed into the World Trade Towers, the North Tower first and then the South Tower. I was three and a half blocks away and I heard the second plane hit the south tower, this giant thud sound, and that tower imploded first. A third plane hit part of the Pentagon. A fourth plane was supposed to hit either the White House where the President lives and works or Capitol Hill where our Congress, the U.S. Senate, and the House of Representatives meet. 
but uh, that plane crashed in Pennsylvania. And uh, what happened is uh, this, had, this terrorist attack, which killed 3,000 people, it was not engineered by a nation state like R Russia or China, no. Uh, what happened is 19 of the 21 terrorists, they were Saudi Arabian citizens, but they belonged to a terrorist organization called Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had safe haven to uh, have training camps for their guerrilla fighters and terrorist fighters uh, to, uh, to train and plan terrorist attacks. And they were given safe haven by the Afghan uh, Afghanistan government led by a group called the Taliban. And uh, so this was terrible. Uh, 3,000 people died on that day. And uh, what we don't have to talk about is, is what we did almost immediately. The United States attacked Iraq. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. But uh, we made a terrible mistake. We attacked Iraq. And we engaged in a war and we overthrew a dictator, Saddam Hussein, and uh, also we engaged in a war in Afghanistan. The United States has largely withdrawn from these countries. Uh, Iraq still has lots of challenges and it's still trying to maintain uh, a government. Uh, United States, we do have some troops, special forces, and we do have some special forces in Afghanistan. We've largely withdrawn in terms of a, a long-standing conventional army. There, there are a lot of things that we didn't do well and a few things we did do well there in both countries. We don't have enough time to talk to about it. So let's just summarize what the United States has done post 9-11 and then we'll go on to chapter 3 and I'll tell you what's bothering me. Um, what we've done uh, post 9-11, uh, especially after we've disengaged from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, what we've done is this, we've taken the fight to the enemy. We use pilotless planes called drones. We uh, target uh, people we perceive to be terrorists, we attack them, drop bombs, and kill them. Some, frequently it's in Afghanistan, sometimes it's in, uh, sometimes it's in, uh, uh, in Pakistan, uh, other times it's in failed states like Syria and Somalia. So uh, we also provide military aid, we provide training, we, do, uh, we, po we provide piloted planes to conduct bombing, because in addition to Al-Qaeda, which still exists, there's another terrorist group called ISIS, and they have a conventional army, and they occupy parts of Iraq and Syria. And what the United States is doing is we're supplying uh, our allies in the Iraqi army, and their militias, the Kurds of northern Iraq, they're called the Peshmerga, and, and we're, uh, we're providing with pilots, we're bombing ISIS, and we're, and we're also, we have our special forces and still select elite troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, they are conducting missions and they're also on their own and they're also fighting, taking the fight to the terrorists. In this case, uh, ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda. So this is what we're doing militarily. In terms of uh, intelligence, we've greatly enhanced our ability our spy satellites, our ability to monitor uh, phone calls. Um, we, through the National Security Agency, the Department of Defense, and the CIA, uh, we have a much robust approach to the United States. We also have a law in place called the Patriot Act, in which uh, suspected terrorists, we call them uh, enemy combatants, uh, they, can be, uh, they can be locked up without a trial. And uh, that may be unconstitutional, and that's something we're still trying to work out between us. And also, we've been uh, conducting bugging. There are courts known as FISA courts. We sometimes work through them. Sometimes we use extra legal means to do so. So, uh, and we base it upon the Patriot Act. So, uh, the Patriot Act uh, also might be involved in uh, violating uh, 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 people's right to privacy. So, uh, so essentially, we might be violating. Uh, two constitutional amendments in terms of the right for privacy and um, again, the right against illegal search and seizure with the Patriot Act. But that's a long conversation and another discussion, but I just want you to know that was in the mix and that's something that we're going to eventually work out. Um, in addition, what the United States is doing is we're providing uh, aid to local police. I'll give you one example. In New York City, we're 8.3 million people, um, NYPD, New York City Police Department. Uh, there are between 30 and 35,000 uh, policemen 
in the city of New York and at least a thousand of them are counterterrorism and we have our own mini CIA. Uh, what they've done is they've ringed New York City with radiological devices. Suppose uh, terrorists, the, the groups that I mentioned, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, terrorist organizations we've never heard of, suppose they try to, uh, e even though it may be rem remote, suppose they decide to try to sneak um, uh, nuclear materials plutonium and highly enriched and uranium into New York. We have by plane, by sea, and uh, devices all throughout the five boroughs to detect this. We have, uh, uh, these devices are supposed to also de detect not only materials that can be used for weapons of mass destruction like plutonium, they're used to detect weapons of mass disruption and I'm talking about radiological materials. Uh, the, those are used in hospitals, medical centers, and uh, private industry. Um, so uh, those are the things that are being done also to aid uh, police, intelligence, and the military. At the airports, we have that pretty well covered. So uh, it's remote to impossible to, to hijack a plane now. Transportation Safety Administration, everything that goes into an airplane is, is x-rayed. Everything you carry on to a plane is x-rayed. There are certain items you can't carry on to an airplane. Uh, any kind of sharp materials that you used to be able to buy in an airport, you can't buy. Transportation Safety Administration uh, has done a superb job in airports, but um, I, the, one of my concerns is, and we'll be talking about it in the next chapter, chapter three, is uh, I don't know if we're completely covered in ports nor uh, rail transportation and subways. But suffice to say, uh, the United States is, we've greatly enhanced our military intelligence and police abilities and Transportation Safety Administration, uh, we've greatly enhanced that at least cover very well airports. So in answer to the question, are we safe? We're never going to be 100% safe. Uh, what I refer to is uh, Steve Brill wrote an article for Atlantic Monthly Magazine in September uh, 2016. And Brill said uh, it's possible that the new normal might be um, three or four times a year we're going to see terrorist attacks. So we're much, much safer than we were. I'm not going to quantify it uh, compared to 15, 16 years ago, but uh, we are much safer. And um, so now that uh, I've answered that question, let's, uh, or I've tried to answer that question, let's talk about uh, what bothers me and what, what uh, sometimes keep me up at nights and what is the next unexpected situation that could come up and it may come up. Uh, and I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about uh, uh, an event that could, uh, cause death, uh, significant economic distress in this country, and great psychological shock in this country. So I've been concerned about this, and that's why I feel compelled to have the conversation. 